comes from Matthew 14, 22 through 36. Immediately Jesus made, disciple, made the disciples get into a boat and go out ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance off from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Jesus got down, or then, then Peter got down out of the boat walked on water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And then, and, and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Th then those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. When they had crossed over the, when they had crossed over, they landed in Nazareth, and when the men of the place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the uh, surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick touch the side edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. All right. Thank you for, for that reading. Uh, such good stuff in, in that uh, scripture. It's, it's, it's one of those things that we hear as a kid, right? We've heard that story uh, probably a hundred times if you grew up in the church. There's something about seeing Jesus walk on water that probably, like, sticks to you, right? Like, wow, like, am I seeing this right now? Like, and then... Peter gets out, right? Like, that, that's even more astounding. But we're going to dive into that a little bit more in a second. I just want to draw your attention to two things. Two, tomorrow starts our 21 days of prayer, and that's why we had a couple uh, different uh, board members come up today and pray. We, we want prayer to be one of the biggest things that we do, one of the first things we do. We want prayer to, to, to we want to be a praying church. We want to be a church that prays. We want to be defined by prayer. I, I, I think when we realize that, that our, our dependency upon Christ will, will, will lead us, that, that would be an amazing thing if we could be led by our dependency on Christ. Because no one here has the power that, that Christ has. He is a new kind of king. He is different. And, and we need to be dependent on him, right? So let lean into prayer uh, even more than we typically do over the next 21 days. Please join me on Wednesday night uh, this week, and, and we'll pray. Please join me on Sunday mornings at 8.30 uh, every week, and we'll pray. We want to take this time and pray. There is also a prayer guide. Uh, for you for the next 21 days. If you notice, it's not just a prayer guide, but we're going to be reading through the book of John together. Uh, 21 days, 21 book, uh, chapters in John. So one chapter a day. And, and so our prayer will be led by the scripture. So what you see in the scripture, pray that thing. I kind of highlighted maybe portion of that to, to help you maybe to, to think in that way. Uh, but I pray that uh, not only we'll be a praying church, but we'll be a pr church of, of, of the Word. And hopefully we can, when we pray God's Word, uh, it, it'll, it'll change us in dramatic ways. So please join me uh, in that each day. And also, just a reminder, every day at 3.20, set your alarm on your phone uh, and say a 30-second prayer, a minute prayer, whatever you have time for. I was talking about that with someone this week as 
my alarm went off, and they're like, what, what's going on, right? You know, we were at the pastor conference in Orlando, and they're like, what, what just happened? And I'm like, oh, we set our alarm every day for 3.20. And they're like, oh, that's a good idea for, for Ephesians 3.20. And, and that's just a constant reminder for us to be in prayer uh, for our church. With that, let us pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to what you have to say through your word. Uh, The story that has been told so many times. Make it fresh, make it new. Help us to be able to see you. We praise you in your name. Amen. So he sent off his disciples in a boat. He's like, we're done here. It's time to go, but I'm not going to go with you. Right? He, he sends them off. He's like, I'll catch up with you later. Now, this is probably not typical for someone to do, but he's like, go. I, I will catch up later. And so Jesus went on to the mountainside by himself to pray. This is something he did a lot, to pray, to catch up with his father, to be able to, to, to connect with him, because he knew uh, connection with his father was a, one of the most important things he could do. And he did it all. He did it alone, because sometimes we get distracted by others, right? We get distracted by the things going on, and sometimes we just need to get alone to refocus. It's a great example. We all need this example. We all need prayer, because prayer fills us up. Prayer, prayer prepares us for, for, for what's next. Prayer strengthens us, and, and prayer leads us. I hope. I hope it leads each and every one of us, and all of us. Now, when done, Jesus just starts walking, right? They're already gone. They've been gone for quite a while. And and, uh, as we know, we find out that it's on the fourth watch of the night. Now, that's not a term that we typically use, on the fourth watch of the night. But typically, Jews Jews would have four different watches. And the fourth watch was during the 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., so probably the hardest watch of the night. Someone was keeping an eye out, so just to make sure maybe if the storm was coming or something was going to happen, right, if, if attackers were coming, just keeping a watch. Now, this fourth watch, you might know, is also the darkest part of the day, right, dark night, right? So, so, The sun's been down for a while. It's on the farthest part of the globe before sunrise, right? The darkest part of the day is right before the dawn. Now, as Jesus starts walking out on the water, right? This is typical, not not, like something that has not been seen before. He's, he's, He's walking out on the lake, and then there's these winds and these waves. It's not, I'm not sure how big of a storm it is, but it's something. It's, it's not a gentle breeze. It's, it's not small waves, right? This is unexpected. This is very, very unexpected, because as we might know, it's never happened before, right? No one just walks on water. The closest we have is water skiing, maybe. Right? Like, it, it's just not normal. But Jesus is a new kind of king, and he does things a little bit differently than, than the rest of us. He, he does things differently than all the other kings. But the d- disciples don't realize this is Jesus, and they see this figure coming to them, and they think it's a ghost. They think something happened, and they're, they're, they're scared. They're petrified. Right? And they cry out in fear. Now, I think we all experience times of fear. These moments of fear where maybe we lose control of the car because we hydroplane and we're a little bit scared. We, we, we find out there is a shooting at the mall and maybe we know that somebody's at the mall and we're a little bit scared. There, there's a lot of things going on in the world to be scared of, right? There. There are all kinds of different things to fear, all right? And there's two types of fear. Uh, uh, first, a uh, physical and imminent danger, right? Things that are happening right at that moment that, that, that are scary, right? 
We, we've experienced a lot of things different uh, that, that, that have happened this year that are scary, that, that, that are something to, to fear, right? You know, we live in, in a dangerous world. We live in a dangerous city. We, we, we live in a place where there's a lot of things going on, and it's scary, right? As I mentioned, you know, like the Greenwood Mall, right? Like that, that is scary when, you know, multiple people that we knew were at that mall at that time. You know, the indie, indie murder rate, right? Like that's crazy, right? We're, we're one of the highest per capita cities in the nation. That's scary. You know, we live in a place that has tornadoes, right? Like nature is trying to get us. Right, all these different things, and then everything from snakes and spiders to heights. Public speaking, people are scared of all kinds of things. But some of those things aren't an imminent and physical danger, but they still produce this anxiety, this this second type of fear in us, that this thought about possibilities of what could happen. And I think those are the things that really hinder us even more than this physical and imminent danger of what could happen. Because while these things do happen, while there's a lot of different things that are going on in our world that could hurt us or, or, or that are definitely imminent dangers, a lot of it is that we want to avoid. We, even though they are small pockets here and there, right? Like, I've never come across a shooting. Like, I've never been at a shooting. But we hear about this, so we're like, well, we just never go to the mall at all, right? Like, well, so, so, you know, I, I, I think the mall's safer and safer every time something actually like that happens, right? Because they're, they're acting on, on things like that, right? All these different things that are going on, but we think about the possibilities of what could happen. But we shouldn't stop living because of the possibility of something that's going to happen, right? The thing is that we need to know is that Jesus is with us. Throughout all these different things to be afraid of, that Jesus is always with us, right? We just talked about that. Emmanuel, he came to be with us. And it's not just during Christmas time that he's with us. He's with us all the time. He's, he's always present with us. He's always there. And he's saying, take courage. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Right? He's just saying, it's okay. You know, Don't have this anxiety of what I'm going to do. Right? Like, you don't have to worry about it. It's me, right? Don't be afraid of me, because Jesus is with us. And, and so is the church, right? When we're afraid, why don't we just call someone up? Say, I need help. Pray with me right now. You know, I, I think we all need this little love and little encouragement from time to time. To, to be with someone, to encourage them. You know, all the disciples here were afraid. All of them were afraid, but only one of them spoke, and it was Peter. Peter spoke up, and he said, Lord, if it's you, then tell me to come out on the water. And Jesus just said one word here. Jesus said one word, and it was come. Come. So what did Peter do? He, he came. Peter got down out of the boat, and he walked on water towards Jesus. Now, this is amazing, right? Like, this is not something that typically happens, right? So, before we kind of dive on in that, I would want to ask you, would you get out of the boat? Would you get out of the boat? There's a storm going on, there's wind and the waves going on. Would you get out of the boat? This is a big question of faith. This is, this is a big question. Would you have done it. If Jesus said, get out of the boat and come to me, would you have come? You know, we, we talk about this obedience of Jesus. But is this obedience of Jesus something that can even overcome fear? Right? And, and, and here, Peter experiences this moment of faith. 
to actually step out of the boat, right? We all have these moments and experience, experience times of faith just like we do with experience times of fear, right? But getting out of the boat is a big risk. Getting out of the boat is a big risk. And it is easy to say that we would do it, but have you actually been in a storm, in a boat, and Jesus actually say, come, get out of the boat, right? Getting out is a big risk. Now, Jesus said, come. And, and, and maybe, maybe he was only talking to Peter. But there were 12 people in that boat, and only one person got out of that boat. So 11 other people stayed in the boat. Only one stepped out. Now, Peter is a fisherman. He knows waters. He's probably been on a, a boat with a storm before, right? He, he's probably experienced it. So if any of them did, right, there, there's multiple fishermen, but if any of them are going to you know, experience something and, and get out of the boat, maybe it's him. Maybe he knows the water. Maybe, maybe, maybe he knows it's okay. Or maybe he knows enough that he should stay in the boat, right? Like maybe he knows that he can't actually go out in a storm and, and walk on water. Maybe he just knows that physics, it's not going to work out well. Now, probably I didn't expect Luke to get out, right? He's a doctor, right? Uh, or Matthew, a tax collector. He, you know, those aren't their fortes. But Jesus knew, or Peter knew, that Jesus was on that water and he wanted to go to Jesus. And he, he, he knew that he wanted to be with him. Now, faith is, is a partnership with Christ, right? God calls us to do something, we have to do it, right? God... God says to do this, we have to actually respond and, and do something. Now, stepping out of the boat was, was Peter's response of faith in this moment. So what do you think was harder for Peter? To get out of the boat or walk on water? Right? To get out of the boat was actually a decision that he could make. But to walk on water was not something that he could do. Physically, he could not do it. But he had to get out of the boat. Only one was in his ability and power, and that was his, to get out of the boat. The other was in Jesus' power to let him walk on water. So he had no power that way. The other, he had no control. He had to get out of the boat, though, to experience the walking on the water. Sometimes we have to do something bold to experience God's power. And if we don't get out of the boat, we'll never be able to experience that power, if we just stay safe, we'll never be able to experience God's power. If you follow Christ, you have to have, at least have, have this one story of getting out of the boat, right? This, this saying, okay, Jesus, I'm ready. I, I want to follow you. Please forgive me. Please, 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 please forgive my sins for for. All that I have done, please forgive me. That's, that, that's a step of getting out of the boat. But that's not the only time anybody should actually get out of the boat. Because Peter, Peter had an experience of, of following Jesus, right? He, he said, come follow me. And, and, and Peter left the, 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 the boat with all the fish and followed after Jesus. And now he's saying, get out of the boat again, right? Get out of the boat, come. So P Peter had to make a second decision to actually come and follow him, to come to him on the water. Now, I think Jesus always gives us one more come, right? One more. There, there's always one more come. Come do it. Now, remember, he was saying this to someone who was already following him. And I, I think so, so much that we often miss his come because we think, oh, I've already come. I've, I've already said yes. But we have to continue to say yes. We have to continue to get out of the boat. And, and Peter stepped off that boat, only one though, and, and walked towards Jesus. In verse 30 it says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. Now I think this is interesting, beginning to sink. What is beginning to sink? Like, when I think of, of walking on water and you're sinking, 
you splash through the water. Like, you know, we, we, we look at these different uh, Christ, Christian children's stories, and G- Peter's up to his knees in, in the water. He's not, you know, is, is he slow? Is it quicksand? Is he just going down slowly? Or, or, or he, he's plunged underwater, and Jesus actually has to grab underwater to pull him up, right? Like, you know, I don't think Peter would have been scared if he was up to his knees in water, right? Maybe it was only a foot deep, right? Like, but, but there's not, not anything to be scared of then. Like Peter, Peter was probably drowning. He was probably gasping for air. Even though he knew how to swim, he was probably struggling. Now Peter was good as long as he had his eyes on Jesus, right? But when he saw wind, and I don't know how it was. Maybe he had his his gaze on Jesus the whole time, but just like right behind Jesus, he saw the wind, right? Like, and, and thought about it for that second, right? It's easy to get distracted and, and lose sight of Jesus. It's easy to 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 struggle, right? It's easy to let this doubt creep in. You know, and I, I think we all experience doubt. We all experience times of fear. We all experience times of faith. We all experience times of doubt. But when, when it happens, when we take our eyes off Jesus, we, we, when we allow these distractions to happen uh, with, uh, to us, we need to remember Jesus is still with us. Jesus didn't leave him. Right? When, when, G, when, when Peter experienced these doubts, Jesus is still right there with him. In fact, he didn't leave him. He, he, he actually picked him back up. He, he, he offered him his arm and pill, pulled him back up. And in times of doubt, Jesus does not leave us. Doubt does not discredit our faith. He is still here. Right? Jesus did not abandon Peter. Peter cried out, Lord, save me, which is interesting because he's drowning. All right? Have you ever tried to speak or cry out when you're drowning? Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? See, there's still that aspect of faith there. Because there, there, if you have a mustard seed of faith, right, you can move mountains. There's still that faith there. And he say, he, he's acknowledging that faith. You of little faith. Why did you doubt? In other words, hold on to the faith you have. Have faith in your faith. Have doubt in your doubt. You know, Jesus is with us and so is the church. When we are struggling, when we are doubting, call up someone that has strong faith. Don't call someone up that doesn't like Jesus. Don't call someone up that that, that has all the doubt in the world. Call up someone that has the strongest faith that, that you know. We don't abandon those who are struggling in their faith. We come alongside them and encourage them. Everybody needs encouragement, right? Everybody needs help sometimes. Everybody needs a little bit of faith. Everybody needs a little bit of support. Everybody needs the church. And that's what the church is all about. We are, we are not just a place where, where we come and worship once a week. We are a support center for those that aren't part of the church, right? Because we all experience times of fear. We all experience times of faith. We all experience times of doubt. Now, who we become out of those experiences will build us. Will will our fear grow or our trust in Christ grow? Will, Will our faith grow or our cynicism? Will our doubt grow or our confidence? You know, Christ can work through these situations to enhance his faith. Right? Peter, Peter grew in that moment. <laughs> Peter knew that Jesus was going to be there for him through every moment of it. But Peter's life did not get easier that moment. And Peter wasn't perfect from that moment either, right? Peter had a lot of struggles after that. In fact, it uh, probably actually got harder for him. Because he knew. He knew that Jesus was going to be there for him. But he still struggled with opportunities of of fear and doubt, right? 
He denied Christ from a little girl, even. Right? I know you were with Jesus. No, like, can you imagine? Like, this fear set in. He didn't want to end up like Christ. He denied him. And this past week, Jenny and I were down in Orlando for for the gathering, a Wesleyan pastor's conference. And and there were so many good speakers. It was good to catch up with friends and and people I hadn't seen in years. It was great. Now, Steve Deneff, uh, as as some of you know, is a pastor up at College Wesleyan uh, Church in Marion, Indiana. We we went through the book, uh, Soul Shift, uh, written by him and David Drury. And Steve Deneff was one of the, the main speakers for, for the time there. Now, I, sometime maybe I'll just play his message for you. But he did talk about some of the things that would actually happen in the next five to ten years that we would have to, like, church up for, right? You know, that we would have to church up, right? Because it's going to get harder. It's not going to get easier, he was saying. It's going to get harder. And, and, and he had a word for pastors, but I, th- I think the same word can be for the churches too, right? In, in the next five to ten years, it'll only get harder, and we have to learn to do hard things. We need to learn that, hey, just because there are hard things going on doesn't mean that Jesus isn't real and that, uh, you know, we, we should just give up. We, should throw in, we shouldn't throw in the towel. But he said there are five things that, that, that we need to, to, to get better at uh, in these hard things. The first one is pressure. Pressure. The church will have more pressure going into the future. Now, what is pressure? Doing something, this is Steve Deneff's definition. Doing something that matters when you do not know the outcome. We don't know the outcome in a lot of ways, right? In a lot of things. And living with pressure is hard. Living with pressure is hard. How do you, do you know how a diamond is formed? Pressure, right? Pressure, pushing in on the diamond and compacting it harder and harder. And and the more pressure, the better the diamond. But it wouldn't have been a diamond without the pressure. Pressure is not always a bad thing. Pressure can develop us and persevere us. Diamonds are created with it, and the more pressure, the better the diamond. The second thing he said we need to get better at is risk, taking risks. Churches need to take risks. You know, we only have something to lose when you don't have a lot. But when, when, you there, when you don't have a lot to lose, there's not a lot to risk, right? Sometimes we need to understand that we don't have anything to lose. That we don't have anything to lose. And we need to risk it, even the little bit that we have. We need to learn to take chances. And there is more risk in doing nothing, I think. Because if we don't do nothing, we know the outcome. We know the outcome of doing nothing. Now, are you willing to risk everything to see someone come to Christ? The third thing is tension. We need to get good at tension. What? Good at tension, right? Like, tension is a pull in an opposite direction. So, like, tug of war, right? At the beginning of, of tug of war, the, 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 the rope is limp. But when you put tension on it, when you put force going in either direction, that, that, that's put bringing tension. It's a pull in opposite direction. Tension is, is hard to live with, right? But we need to get good with it. We, we need to get better at it. But we... You know, because we already have tension. We already have this struggle. We need to learn to live in tension, right? Many of us are not good with disagreement. We think disagreement is disunity. And have, having all these conversations about uh, disagreeing on one thing or another, and, and, and we think 
It's bad. Is it? Or can that disagreement challenge us and encourage us even? Can that tension uh, be good for, that, for the church? The, the fourth thing, we need to get good at criticism. And that's not necessarily me criticizing you. Right? That's not necessarily you criticizing me. But we need to get good at taking criticism because people are critical. How do you respond to criticism? Now, we need to learn to hear things, and this is uh, one of the things that uh, Steve Dines says, we need to learn to hear things that your mother would never say to you. Right? Because mothers are always so positive and encouraging and loving. Right? They, 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 they want to come alongside you and, and, and nurture you. But there are things that people will say to you that your mother never said to you, and it's going to hurt. It's going to like feel like a dagger like stabbing your chest, and it's going to hurt. He also said, if you protect the ego, you'll never be able to grow. There, there is some good criticism. Right? There is some good critical criticism, and we can learn and grow from that. And five, the last thing that the church needs to get good at is change. And I think so many people are so adverse to change. People don't want to change. But the thing is, the world's changing around us. It's changing with you or without you. And if you don't change, you're just going to be left behind. Change is happening. Now, Steve Deneff ministers on a college campus. So there's a lot, he, he sees a lot more change even than we do because he, he's seeing people come in for four years at a time and, and they go. He, he's having professors coming into his church and they may move on to, to another college or, or something like that. He sees a lot more change than most churches, right? Because he, he has a revolving congregation. I don't know how, what, what the percentage of uh, uh, people that are in his congregation are students, but that's changing all the time, right? Like in, 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 unless they get a job in Marion and they stay there, right? That, that, that's changing. But he says changing is constant. Changing is going to happen. He says this. A lot of people think change happens or, or culture changes every generation. That's not true, he says. He says, and from what they've noticed, at least in their congregation, change happens every two years. Every two years. Can we be okay with constant change? You know, there's something about that. But here... Jesus and, and, and Peter are still outside of the boat. And, and they br- get back on the boat, and what happens? What happens at that moment when they get on the boat? Storm still. That's first. Second, what happens? The disciples worship. You are truly the Son of God, they say. That's an amazing thing. All this thing that they, they see and all these things that are going on around them, all this change, all, all this tension, all, all this risk, right? Because Peter took a risk to get out of the boat. There, there was tension and, and there was probably disagreement. No, stay in the boat, Peter. You, like, you know what's good for you. That's just a go. Right? Like, whatever it might be, Jesus was there. And it ended in worshiping him. When I think about that, when I think about worshiping Christ, there's nothing more important. And that's what we, as a church, need to be about. Now, we're going to take a time of communion right now. I'm going to ask Andrea to come up, and she's going to just play. And typically, I, 
I, we have the, the cups on, on, on our chairs, but as you can see, there's a basket in, in the front. Today, I'm not going to ask you to get out of the boat. I'm just going to ask you to get out of your chair. You can come forward. You can pray at the altar, or you can return to your seat. If maybe you can't come up yourself, maybe just physical limitations or something like that, you can ask somebody to, to get it for you and bring it to you. But during this time, I, I want you to reflect. I want you to reflect on, on your life. I want you to reflect on what God's calling you to. Maybe it's something that you fear. Maybe, maybe it's a step of faith that you need to take. Maybe, maybe there's, there's still some doubt in your life that, that, that you need to, to process and work through. Whatever that might be, let us take this, this moment, the, the, these few minutes, whatever it might be, and give, give, give this focus to Christ. Not, not necessarily uh, looking at just the storm, but taking the storm to Jesus. Taking our fears, taking our doubts, taking our maybe little faith that we have to Jesus. Because Jesus, out of anybody, out of anybody, he dealt with pressure, he dealt with risk, he dealt with tension, he dealt with criticism, and he dealt with change. His whole life, his whole ministry was all about those five things. And it thrived in it. And if it wasn't for that, we would not be here today, right? Like, we would not be here today if he didn't take a risk. If he, if he uh, didn't... Uh, put up with attention, if he didn't take the pressure, like, we would not be here today. And that's why he stood in, in the upper room with, 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 with the disciples, and he said, this is my body. It's going to be broken, right? How much more pressure or tension can you have? It's going to be broken for you. And this, this, this blood, the blood of the new covenant, it's going to be spilled for you. Take and drink. This is my body. This is my blood. And while we don't actually think that's a physical representation, that is the, the reminder of it. So please, please uh, play as we come forward, as, as we take this time and say, Lord, this year is yours. Lead us. I'm okay with change. Show me how I need to change. Show us as a church how we need to change. Take and eat. Take and drink in remembrance of Him.
Lord, as we come to you right now, help calm our fears. Help us to know that you are there with us even when we do fear. Strengthen us even though we do fear knowing that you will be there with us along the way. Lord, in our faith, I pray that you multiply it. We know that faith as small as a mustard seed will move mountains. Kind of wonder sometimes how big my faith must be, though. I've never moved a mountain. But I know a guy that has. I know our God has. And can do at any moment. Lord, strengthen us. Encourage us. Help us to know that you are with us. Lord, help calm our doubts. Help us to know that you are there. Lord, in all these scenarios, we also have the church. The church is not a place where we just come on Sunday and that's the only time we ever see the other people. But the church are the people. And every time that we're together, it's the church. We're called to be a light of the world. Lord, help illuminate us. Help reflect us to the world. We want to reflect you. And bring love, joy, peace, and hope to our friends and our family members who are struggling. May we be good at hard things. We pray these things in your name. Amen.